Hello, folks. This is Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato, and joining me in the East Main Media Studio is, in fact, Nicole Swinerton, a senior producer at our production company, the Caucus Educational Corporation, and our colleague, Mary Gamba, who is the person who runs our operation every day. She doesn't produce programming, but you did in the past. Absolutely. And you appreciate our programming and love this new series called Think Tank, the podcast. So since you love it so much and you know where to find it, I love it. why don't you let other people know where to well, find it? Yeah. And I love Think Tank, the broadcast. I love Think Tank, the podcast. And if you like what you're hearing, you could subscribe on Apple Tunes or Google Play. You could also visit our website at steveautobato.org. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. And as always, follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato and on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD. So on this edition of Think Tank, the podcast, I sit down with Chris Matthews. You may know Chris Matthews. He is the shy and retiring, I'm joking. He is the loud and boisterous and often controversial host of MSNBC's Hardball and the author of a compelling book, Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit, is about the late United States Attorney General, the brother of Jack Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, who ran for president in 1968, assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. As in fact, he was moving toward trying to be nominated in 1968 to run for president five years after his brother, Jack Kennedy, was killed on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas. And so Jack Kennedy was known by many books, movies. Bobby Kennedy, different character, tough, tough as nails, did not have the charisma of his brother, did not have the natural charm of his brother, did not like public speaking as his brother did. But boy, was he tough. And Chris Matthews in Think Tank, the podcast, talks about him. By the way, neither one of you, I don't know, you weren't around at that time. I was as a kid. What is the most interesting thing for you, Nicole, that you found about Chris Matthews in this Think Tank, the podcast? I love this interview, and I hope that listeners will, too. I think that hearing Chris Matthews describe who Bobby Kennedy was in relation to his family and also in relation to the times that he was living in was really cool. And to hear what a generous guy he was is is interesting to look back on that. I did happen to think a lot about one thing throughout the interview is that Times are so different now. Why, why do you say that? Because he says how good he could have been. This is or, Chris Matthews. Or, on Chris Matthews, Tank exactly. How, how great Bobby Kennedy could have been, or if we had someone like him today, he'd be a great. But but we really have no idea who you are in the age of social media, who you are with a 24-hour news cycle. And I just think sometimes comparing those two eras is just so hard. And maybe he would have been awesome. It's a horrible tragedy that he was killed. But I just think that that's something I've been thinking about a lot. And Chris Matthews says it. By the way, we, well, he also in this Think Tank, the podcast, Chris Matthews offers his own perspective and says that in many ways he thought Bobby Kennedy was a uniter and he feels that President Trump is a divider. But he also, in this Think Tank, the podcast interview, he says that President Trump is a master, a master communicator who thrives on confusion and controversy. And he said he's really good at it. He doesn't think it's good for the country, but he's good good politics, at least according to Chris Matthews. Mary, your thoughts on Chris Matthews and Think Tank, the podcast? Yeah, I think he raises a lot of great points. And I agree with Nicole that in today's day and age with social media, everybody needing instant communication, it would be fascinating to see how Bobby would have or would have not embraced that. Because as you said, he wasn't like the other Kennedys. He wasn't as much flashy and no. look at me and all of that. But you kind of need a little bit of that today in order to connect with your audience, right? Especially the younger people want to see, not flashy, but you need to be charismatic. And do you think, because I know you're super into the Kennedys, do you think he had the charisma that would resonate with our people today? You know, it's funny. Charisma is a funny thing. The it factor. Yeah. Here's the thing I, I always thought about. And again, I was really young and as a kid when he was killed in the same year, not far apart from the assassination of Dr. King. I remember being eight or nine at the time and thinking, you almost think the world is ending at the time because these figures who are out there, whether you liked them or didn't like them, I didn't even really know. I just knew they were incredibly important figures in our country. I became fascinated by Bobby Kennedy. And I will tell you this, what was universally appealing was he was tough. I mean, he went after the mob in ways that, I mean, I mean I'm a student of mafia history. He went after Sam Giancana, who was the head of the mob in Chicago, right, who actually replaced Al Capone. Why is that relevant? Because Sam Giancana's girlfriend, Judith Exner, was having an affair with Bobby Kennedy's brother, Jack Kennedy, 
Bobby Kennedy didn't care. He was going after Sam Giancana. He went after the Teamsters and Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, the war between Jimmy Hoffa and Bobby Kennedy. This is a great book called Blood Feud about that. Chris Matthews talks about Bobby Kennedy not as just some charismatic figure, whether he was or wasn't. He talks about him as a rough, tough, law and order Democrat who was not a liberal, soft Democrat in the eyes of some. I don't know how he'd play today, but I'll tell you what. I don't think Bobby Kennedy would have changed anything about who he was and what he believed in order to appeal to anyone on social media or anywhere else, which I think is incredibly appealing. But way more importantly than what I think or what, respectfully, you, Nicole, or you, Mary, think, is what Chris Matthews thinks, because he, in Think Tank, the podcast, talks about Bobby Kennedy and the book, Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit. This is Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank, the podcast, and you're about to hear Chris Matthews. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato, coming to you from uh, WNET's Tisch Lincoln Center studio. We are honored to welcome Chris Matthews, the one and only Chris Matthews. I hope I'm the one and only. Yeah, Chris has uh, seen a horrible every night, seven? Yes. Eastern. I know, I check it every night. Every night. But we're here to talk about your book, Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit. Talk to us. This book, so powerful in so many ways. Why Bobby Kennedy? Well, I didn't realize when I began the project years ago that uh, it would become the 180 degrees of what we have right now, uh, empathy, uh, unity of white and black together, a, a moral compass, all the things we miss right now, we lack right now, we want in our leadership. And he, you know, he wasn't a perfect man, but he exemplified those things. He could walk into a, a what we used to call a ghetto situation in, in Indianapolis and tell these people right in front of them, African-Americans, Martin Luther King was just shot and killed by a white guy. He had to he tell them. That. They didn't know that. And I had the mic, because of working with NBC, you could hear him on the mic saying, the guy next to him, he's up on a flatbed truck, looking in the faces of the people, and, he, and they're all cheering him. And he goes, Is that, do they know yet? And the guy says, no, they don't know. You got to tell them. And uh, this is before Twitter and everything. And you had word of mouth was the way you learned the news. And it showed his ability to connect with people when he just took his skin off and said, look, my brother was killed by a white guy. Uh, we got to get through this. We got to figure this thing out. And, you know... And he talked about, you know, we've got to make an effort. I thought that line in that speech, we got to make an effort, is the best thing anybody's ever said. Because when it comes mm -hmm. to race relations, all you can do is make an effort. You're not going to solve it. Do. You're not going to. But if everybody makes an effort, wow. And he, uh, but, you know, he had guts. He'd go to college kids like at Notre Dame and say, you guys are sitting here on your fat butts with your college deferments and the working guys out there going to war. You know, he'd go to mm -hmm. Lumberjacks in Oregon, in Roseburg, right where they had that shooting a couple years ago, mass shooting, and say, you know, we got to have stop this mail order rifle buying, you know, in those days. Where do they get that, Chris? I mean, I mean, you guys to just taking on Giancana, you know, making, brother, making fun of a mob did. guy. He was he was Al Capone's successor. Get this book. You got the complexity. I mean, Chris, by the way, Chris Matthews, how many books have you written about? This is eight. The, but, uh, third the of the Kennedys. Third, third of the Kennedys. Yeah. There is no one in this country who knows more, understands more, connects more. The Irish Catholic piece of this for yeah. me was so powerful. Yeah. You can you relate it. Well, because they, they, I was born 20 years later than Bobby, and yet, uh, and obviously we weren't rich. We we're regular middle middle people growing up in Tell Philly. Tell where you grew up. I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, right on the border with Bucks County. My father worked for the city. He wrote down what happened in court. Wow. Four brothers, but very Catholic, and sure. things like grilled cheese sandwiches. You know, <laughs> like you just you know, <laughs> tomato soup, but Campbell's tomato soup one Saturday. Just uh, talking about Bishop Sheen, who was on New York here all the time, the New York uh, bishop, and. These things we all had in common, you know, the Coconut Grove fire in Boston in 42 when the wow. BC team was about to have its celebration. But Holy Cross Boston beat College, them. Right? Yeah, and, and Holy Cross beat them so they weren't there for the fire. And they God delivered, you know, and may, being angry about Al Smith losing the election in 28. The and, first Catholic yeah, to be up. All for those things, president. my mom especially was it all. Mattered. It was very much part of our tribal thinking. Did it matter to the Kennedys? Because in you know, the book, yeah, you also say that Joe Kennedy did not. I mean, he had a whole. I don't he voted get, for Hoover. He voted for Hoover uh, yeah. against the Catholic. Yeah, I know. Because he thought the Catholic was too street corner, too east side, west side, too much of a New York accent. Uh, he didn't like the fact that he blew kisses at people in crowds. He didn't like that sort of, you know, Tammany show off thing. He was a he was trying to be a Yankee. You think he was better? Yeah, I think he thought he and was Bobby, definitely. Because the whole Bobby thing. Didn't. Bobby but, was but, a regular. Ethel said to me, Bobby was born a Democrat, meaning lowercase d, regular guy. The reason, one of the reasons I get into writing the book when they asked me to write it at Simon & Schuster was 
I was a Capitol Hill cop, my first job back from the Peace Corps, and I was working at night as a cop. It was a patronage job. I had a gun and a uniform, but really, I was doing it for the, the political job in the daytime. And I got hanging around with this guy, the Capitol engineer, and he said, he'd been working there for years, he said, the only liberal Democratic senator who always said hello to the cops was Bobby Kennedy. And I go, wow, I thought he was just a guy for minorities. Why did he care about all these West Virginia former MP types? Bobby cared about people who had, you know, he liked waitresses, he liked firemen, firefighters, cops, people. construction workers. Different from Jack? He, yeah, Jack was more an aristocrat. Jack's all... An aristocrat. And I, and I, oh, yeah, all Jack's friends were like... Charlie Bartley, fifth generation Yale, Stuart Armsby Gore, David Armsby Gore, the British aristocrat, uh, Dave, uh, you know, Ben Bradley. They were all uh, titled people. And then they were good people, but they weren't regular guys. Bobby, Bobby's friends were like Rayford Johnson, Rosie Greer, the jocks, Jim Whitaker, the mountain climber, John Glenn, um, Andy Williams, I mean, people of accomplishment. I think he liked people that showed physical guts. Because he's trying to find out where to find it for himself. About the, the, Finding the, courage mm. by hanging around with people of courage. I, let, let me, this is one of the things. That was a book. big part of him. By the way, get this book. It is fascinating on so many levels. One of the things that really struck me. People assumed, so many assumed Jack and Bobby very close. In the book, unless I have this wrong, Chris, they were not close for a long time, uh. but got close at critical points in Jack's career when Jack needed Bobby. Well, open up the book and sure. just show that inside cover, because that just tells yeah, you everything. Take, take it, do it. This, this, the publisher had me do this. If you look Bob at the director, get that shot. If you look at the family here. So look how older, here's Bobby, mommy's pet, because his dad had no time for him. And look at his brothers. His brothers are grown-ups, you know? There's Joe. Joe, Joe he's a grown-up. And Jack, too. These are young adults, and Bobby's this Teddy kid. not even in the picture, eight really. Eight years, and here's little Teddy. Looks like a little girl there. Look at him. The baby Big in the difference family. in age. Yeah, and so they weren't hanging. He was at the little kid's table. I mean, Jean, I got that from Jean, his sister. She was there. That's her, Jean. Right. They were in the little kid's table, but Bobby would beg his father, can't you write letters to me like you do to Joe and Jack about the big picture in the world? Spend some time. His father called him a runt. Imagine telling your kid who's 5'8", about average, a little lower than average, and his two brothers are big six-footers, and they're calling the kid a runt. This, this dismissed him. Why was Joe so mean to him? He, he had no use for him. No, what do you mean, no use? The older kid was going to be president. Joe and, was going to be president. And then Jack was going to be Jack, president. Joe was killed Yeah, and the then war. it was Jack's turn, but it was never Bobby's turn. And the old man only liked tough. But Bobby was tough. He became tough for the old man. I believe he started off as a sweet young kid. He hung around. All his basketball playing friends were African American kids back in. This is in the 30s, which is mm. pretty impressive. Uh, uh, he uh, he always showed. So he'd be riding along in a train with his classmate at school, and he'd go, "How can we?" He said, "With well, dad, can't we do something for these people, these poor people?" His father said, "Forget about it." One time, somebody said, "You know, Bobby's got a lot of generosity," and and the old man said, "I don't know where he got that from." He the old man was a not virtue. a nice guy. Chris, he did the not old, see it as a virtue. No, Joe Kennedy was not a nice guy. And wow. his, but Bobby tried to become tough. He, he, he played football at Harvard. He won a letter. He, play, he played till he broke his leg in second year. Uh, whole, and by the way, that's before the Ivy League. The Ivy League is what it is now, but, mm. you know, sort of above club football. But the fact is, back in those days, his team was 18th in the country one time that year. So it was real football, and he was playing on the, on the, on the varsity first team. Bigger picture. And the old man liked that stuff. Yeah, as someone who watches your show on a regular basis, learns from it, challenged by it. This country today and Bobby Kennedy, I know it's ridiculous because it was 1968 when yeah. he was killed and we think so many years later. What could he contribute today, theoretically, to the ridiculous well, I think, I think, divide in this country? You know what he would do? Because the right is pretty much racial. And it's class. You, know, the co you want to become a Democrat? Go to college. That's what it's like now. Yeah, you, you have to be a bit elite to be a Democrat now. And the working class whites have given up on the Democratic elite and they've gone off to vote for Trump or they vote for Reagan before that. Uh, I think he would have tried to keep, he would do things like, he'd drive through the city of Gary, Indiana, which is not like in the movie Music Man. It's an old industrial city with an ethnic population, most Eastern Europeans uh, and blacks coming in, just like sure. it happens in most cities, uh, the migration's going on. But he would ride through the city with, uh, with Richard Hatcher, the first African-American mayor on one side of him in the convertible, and uh, Tony Zale, the, the former white, you know, middleweight champion who had fought Graziano three times. And the other side, just to show, I'm with both of you guys, we got to work together. And we make these vivid, symbolic statements mm -hmm. about working together in both, both communities. He wouldn't take sides. Would he take Trump on? I mean, Trump basically has taken the white community's side, and 
and you know, he's taking a very hard line pro Israeli position on this latest thing. He takes sides. I think Bobby really tried to avoid that. I think he tried to. But he be, stood up. Bring, oh, well, but he, he tried stood to up. On he stood up on values, the segregation on issue. On issues and values, but I think he tried to bring every, and he didn't hate anybody, and he didn't put people down. There's no Archie Bunker in his thinking, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm a big on that. I'm big thinking on that. Once the Archie Bunker thing started in the 70s, the early 70s, where the upper, better educated whites started looking down at working class whites, and he was basically Irish Bunker. We all knew that. It was basically sort of yep. an Irish guy living in Queens. Uh, that sort of division really has gotten really aggravated right now. I mean, you, you, West Side, you run the West Side, I think people look down on those guys and they go, you know, they're just a bunch of uh, deplorables. To use Hillary's mean? word. Remember Hillary's it, word? Deplorable? I, 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 and Obama not, not liked it. Of... He did the same thing. He said they cling to their guns and their religion. Well, you don't make fun of somebody because of their religion. You relate. It's interesting. You relate, at least my perception of you over the years, Chris, is that you relate to those who not only did not vote for Hillary Clinton and may not have liked Trump, but chose to vote for him because they feel lost. You relate to them. Yeah, I do. I think I, because I, think, I think they knew about a party that was being held. You know, Carol King was singing. Everybody's up at Martha's Vineyard having a great time celebrating themselves and how successful they are. You know, Meryl Streep's being mentioned positively. This kind of elite cultural meritocracy where everybody's made it, uh, which is okay. But the trouble with that having made it is there's a sense of condescension to the people that haven't made it. And they hear it, even if it's not intended. They go, wait a minute, nice party. How come I'll never get invited? Ohio, I will uh, never uh, get invited. Michigan, other places, yeah, well, they felt it. Uh, well, just the suburbs of Philly and uh, clearly uh, that you know Erie, well. Erie uh, Scranton. Uh, you know, I think I've had relatives like this. And we don't even talk about it because I don't want to fight with my I love them, my relatives. But I know they had this attitude of, oh, you think you're better than us? Good. We'll vote for the other guy. And I think that's really gotten to be politics today. It's, uh, it's out there. You can hear it. You can feel it. Mm. Uh, people voting for Trump, not out of economic interest. They want to raise. You know, they, got, they want health care for their kids. Mm. They're worried about steroids. I mean, sorry, uh, opiates. They're worried about these, these chemical problems getting into all the white neighborhoods, just like they're in the black neighborhoods. Mm. We know that. But by the way, we're talking to Chris right around uh, Christmas uh, time, holiday season 2017. Uh, go out and check out his book. You mind if I plug it again? Keep at it. I'm joking. I do Chris. believe. I told you, Caroline Kennedy said once, you got to sell these out of the back of your car. <laughs> <'Cause> they, <laughs> tell folks, you, you, you don't make millions selling books. You make them one at a time. You got to go sell them because, you know, uh, Jack Kennedy, the quote all my Kennedy, and yes. he once said, why do you think, because he always believed in starting his campaigns early. He said, why do you think Coca-Cola advertises? Everybody knows there's Coca-Cola. They don't mean it. But to remind people, because right. they're going to go shopping this week. Oh, where's the Coke in the store? Get the Coke in the, in the, in the uh, basket, in, the, in the, the, the shopping cart. So it's just to remind people, uh, you know, right now there are people thinking, what am I going to do for Uncle Joe? I, mean, he, I think he watches hardball, you know. Well, uh, you know. Last night I was writing a, some copy for my show last night. I said, we got two million people watch tonight. Get out there and show the power of the movement. <laughs> my producer said, a little too much, Chris. A little too much. <laughs> By the way, Chris, Chris is sniffling, I should tell you, because it's about 40 degrees in the studio. This is like I David Letterman stuff. Stop. Out what? What? I'm sorry. I, this is PBS. You see, you don't even sweat. There's no Schwitzing going on no, here so, on the so West no Side. So no Nixon stuff going on. Well, I'll tell you the great story. So the second debate between Nixon and Matthews Kennedy. Matthews has the best stories. Uh, and, and Nixon's, he's, the, he's Niagara Falls in the first yes. debate, all over the face. And Kennedy and, looked. Yeah, Kennedy looked. Kennedy, I always liked Kennedy. Kennedy asked. He didn't need any tan, uh, he didn't need any lotion or anything or makeup. <laughs> By the way, Kennedy faked about on the makeup. He said, I don't want any makeup. And Nixon was afraid Kennedy would make fun of him as some sort of problem, you know, was, you know unmanly or something. Then Kenny gets back into his room and they put the makeup on him, and it's just so true. <laughs> the second time, the Nixon people were in control. It was the NBC studios in D.C. The Nixon people had control of the studio for some reason. So they, they lowered to like now, here. This meat Cold. lock. This meat lock. Meat lock over yeah. there. <laughs> You're looking for the bodies hanging up here. And uh, so then uh, Bobby ends up, and Jack, and, all th and the other guy there is Bill Wilson, the, their media advisor. And, he walk, and Jack and Bobby go, what is going on here? We're freezing in here. And he goes running downstairs uh, at Nebraska Avenue at the studio and finds this Nixon guy standing there like a Dave, you know, <laughs> protecting the, the air conditioning unit. And they have a duke, they duke it out and yeah. get the temperature raised. No, but this is stuff goes on in politics. Before, Remember Dukakis? Yeah. He wasn't a very tall D guy. Dukakis with the helmet yeah, in but, 1988? You know, well, he wasn't a very tall guy, so no. he wanted one of these mounds, these secret mounds behind the lectern. And that raised them up? Yeah. Well, they gave him that, but then they made sure there's a camera <laughs> shot from the side to show he's up on the mound. Know, how do you know all this stuff? Constant collection of uh, threads. But who was your mentor in the United States Congress that you work for directly you learned just a little bit from? Tip O'Neill. There it is. And Tip, Tip O'Neill knew all this stuff. And Tip and the Kennedys. 
real connection. Interesting conflict, but yet they got along. Wow. See, see, Tip was a townie, if you will. He was a local. The Kennedys came in. They swooped in. They got the seat. Jack would admit he was a carpetbagger. He moved in. Uh, he had gone to Harvard, which he said in his, he was dictating his memoirs before he was killed. And Jack said, I was, I was a student at Harvard, which was not exactly a plus in that district. <laughs> because the regular people said, Harvard. You know, Elitist. Need, yeah. The last thing on Bobby before Bob, let's Tip go. Bob used to cut the lawn at Harvard. He was sitting down, this local kid yeah. from North Cambridge, with shears, Sitting around, I can imagine right near a tree, shearing around the tree. Yeah. And the overseer, like Simon Legree, came along and said, Off your <laughs> ass, O'Neill. You got to you do it on your knees, not on your butt. Talking to Chris Matthews. Now, what do you think here? his attitude was to the Harvard kids? Tips. I hear you. Exactly. <laughs> not you, appreciated. No, I, don't think I gotta so. tell you, interviewing Chris Matthews is like, I shouldn't say this because they do pay me. It's like not working. All right. Because it's just listening and learning. And by the way, go out and get this book. The book is called. By the way, I love the cover. Isn't it great? The cover. Real do quick, you like go that ahead. cover? The mat and the uh, decal. It's very the decal edge and the, Powerful. Uh, and the what else? The vanilla color. And then um, in this back, this is the Take heart of the book. Take a look at that, Bob. That's the book right there. That that scene of poor, dirt poor family. As Bobby Work, was after was, he was killed. Yeah, and the train was moving and the through. Salute to that guy. That affection is salute. And he's getting his kid to do it. That's patriotism. That's gut patriotism that you feel. And, and they had that towards Kennedy. Yeah. And I think that's lost right now in politics. Nobody has that gut feeling about any of the leaders today. Well, Chris Matthews is a patriot. I don't care whether you agree or disagree with his politics. He is a patriot and he loves this country. Steve, and he also is a big fan of PBS. I just I said say that. I am. I know you. Of course well, you are. A, a Downton coming back? Or not? <laughs> listen, stop. <laughs> Leave it alone. Cut that out. Uh, I love Chris Matthews. You should, too, every night. Seven. You mind if we play? 7 p.m. MSNBC. For like 25 years I've been doing this. Chris Matthews. <laughs> Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, TD Bank, and JIT. New Jersey Sharing Network, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Suez, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.